they set out to find middle ground on the great debt debate and responded by a bipartisan solution that could reduce deficits by nearly $4 trillion. But did the Gang of Six proposal actually cause more problems than it offered to solve? According to Washington Times blogger Kerry Pickett, it's likely that when the president caught wind of the gang's plan last week in which three GOP senators agreed to higher tax increases than what Obama himself had presented to John Boehner, the anointed one decided to ask for $400 billion more in tax hike. So did the gang's plan cause the breakdown in negotiations with Speaker Boehner? And now that it looks like no plan currently on the table is likely to pass, what does the gang plan to do next? Joining me now with reaction are two of the three GOP members of the Gang of Six, Oklahoma Senator Tom Coburn and Georgia Senator Saxby Chambliss. Guys, uh, welcome back to the program. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Sean. Always good to be with you. Good All to right. be with you. Um, Senator Coburn, we'll start with you. Now, I was mad at both of you last week for this regard more than any other is that the, the day that they were voting on cut cap and balance with which both of you support in the House of Representatives the president races to the White House briefing room and oh hang on stop the presses we've got this new deal and in that sense I felt that this was diverting attention of the country away from what I think was a really sound good solution in re did the president purposefully use your plan, in your view, to, uh, to, to distract the country? Uh, you know, I don't know what people's motivations are. It obviously did. Uh, the, 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 the sad situation is the House passed cut, cap, and balance, and uh, the leadership of the Senate <clears throat> instructed all of his members to table it so we couldn't even have a vote on it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, I don't know what the motivations are, but the fact is, is you're right. That's the one thing that could have solved our problems. Yeah. Uh, then, then why, Senator Coburn, did you, were you supporting this instead of everybody uniting? It seems strategically or tactically that the Republicans seem to, you know, with the president having three Republican plans out there and no plan by himself, that we were negotiating or that conservatives, Republicans were negotiating against themselves. Yeah. Well, you remember, when we started this, there wasn't any intention to tie what we were doing to the debt limit, Sean. Uh, you know, the events overtook that. It was delayed uh, for a long period of time. Uh, but there wasn't any, and there still isn't an intention to tie it to the debt limit. Uh, <clears throat> the debt limit is a symptom of the bigger problem, which was what we were trying to address. How do, how do we get almost $4 trillion, which is the only thing that's going to satisfy the rating agencies and the international financial community, how do we get $4 trillion on the table and start working that? And, and we're going to have to come together. We don't control the Senate, uh, and we don't control the White House. So if you can make a move that would make that, that, we, that would you actually get the country out of a problem and yeah. solve a problem, why would we not want to try to do that? Sen Senator Shambles, I spoke to you, and you told me that this, just like Senator Coburn is saying, that this was not a group that was trying to solve the, the debt limit crisis that we are currently in. But the day that this was announced, the day the vote cut cap and balance was taking place, that's the way the president presented it to the country. Well, Sean, as I told you before, it just so happened that the day the six of us made a report back to the bipartisan group of 50 senators that showed up at a meeting that morning, we were just telling them uh, what we had concluded, and we really had not even reached a final agreement at that point in time. And there was a lot of euphoria in the room. A lot of folks uh, were uh, agreeing with the direction in which we were moving. They left the room that day, went outside to a horde of press, and next thing we knew, it just snowballed. There was never any intention to take any action that morning that would interfere with the cut cap and balance uh, debate on the House side. As you said, Tom and I both support that. I still support it. I think the balanced budget amendment is by far the best enforcement mechanism that we can have when it comes to making meaningful discretionary cuts. These two uh, proposals are, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, mutually exclusive to the standpoint that they both will work. Yeah. And they both have good assets that uh, hopefully can be melded together sometime at some point. But, S Senator you know, Chambliss, even after the... Then, then I got to ask you, the, did, did, did the president then, when he ran into that briefing room, did he misrepresent what you were working on to the American people? I think this is very important. 
Yeah, I, you know, he's had a total lack of leadership on this issue. He pounds the table, he gets angry at press conferences, and he thinks he's making an impact and showing leadership. And he's doing everything but that, unfortunately. And I think he was doing anything he could at that point in time to deflect away from the fact that this is falling apart on his watch. And it truly is. He owns this economy. The economy is not doing well. And now he owns this issue. And even when we get by the debt ceiling, Sean, we're still going to owe $14.5 trillion. And it's going up every single day. Yeah. That's why the group that Tom and I were working with was focused on the long-term solution, not the short-term. Right, let me ask you both if you support this idea, uh, and, and I've been in contact with Congressman Connie Mack and Senator Rand Paul, your colleague, and I'll ask both of you, starting with you, Senator Coburn, um, and that is the idea of cutting 1%, in other words, changing the baseline, because we have all these CBO-scored budgets into the future that all project out 7% growth a year. But if we could reduce spending 1% a year, every year for six years, they contend, and starting where the budget is right now and not, and getting rid of all those projected increases, and we could balance the budget in six years. Is that something that could get traction, do you think, in the Senate? Yeah, but, but <clears throat> again, that, that would do it, but that's a political answer rather than a policy answer. And let me tell you why, Sean. <clears throat> we have so much waste. You know, I put out $9 trillion of potential cuts. When you do a 1% solution where you cut everything 1%, there are some things that the government has a responsibility to do. And what you do is you don't reform them, you don't improve them, you don't make them more effective, you just cut 1%. So the stuff that's wasting, you cut 1% instead of 100%. And the stuff that might be something that we want to do, you cut it too. So yeah. it's, the chicken, it's the chicken's way out. The fact is, is that members of Congress need to get study and know, and you can find nine trillion reasons to cut the budget if you just look at back in the black. Well, what they're so, saying is that if you wanted to cut, um, say, education by 10%, and you can't come to consensus, then it's an across-the-board cut. So the Congress well, has the option to act as long as they reach that dollar figure. I wouldn't have any problem supporting it as long as you make the members of Congress make tough decisions. And what this has all been about, uh, the, the reason you're seeing this battle is too many people don't want to own up and go yeah. home and explain, I'm not for this and here's why, and here's why we need to fix it. It's just like the Medicare. You, you can say all you want to the president, can say all he wants, that we're not going to touch Medicare, but the fact is is in 2016, Medicare Part A goes belly up. All right, Doug, we're going to change it. Uh, Chambliss, go ahead. Last that's word. A problem, that's a problem with the 1% solution, too, which, frankly, I think is a good idea. It's another good idea that's on the table that the Democrats are not going to even let us consider. But Bruce Cook of Atlanta is the author of that uh, proposal. Good guy, smart guy. If you do it for seven years in a row, you get spending down to 18% of GDP. That's where we need to be. But you don't reform entitlements by just cutting everything 1% a year. And we've got to reform entitlements if we're going to make this work. All right. Thank you both for being with us. Appreciate your time. Good to be with you, Thank sir. Thank you, Senators. Let not your heart be troubled. When we come back, our great, great, great American panel. Next.